Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to uh, the last session for today on uh, research in databases. Uh, we have actually uh, changed the session a little bit because uh, we will be having a guest uh, who will be joining us in a few minutes, Professor Sunita Saravagi, who is uh, one of the leading international experts in the area of uh, data mining. Uh, she started off her PhD in the area of databases, but uh, after her PhD she moved into the area of data mining and she is uh, been the uh, PC chair of various uh, leading conferences and very well renowned in this area. She will be joining us in about 10 minutes time. So uh, the goal of uh, this evening session was to have a discussion on research uh, in general. Uh, so last time I had presented a few points on uh, how to go about doing research and I had taken some questions on these. I am sure many of you would have more questions. and. Uh, the other uh, thing was last time we didn't cover any specifics uh, in, in detail and some people had been asking me about uh, data mining research. So uh, this time around uh, I requested uh, Professor Sunita Saravagi to join us and so you can ask any questions you have on data mining uh, which she will be happy to answer. She will join us, she is here and will join us in a couple of minutes. So let us uh, start the discussion with uh, questions from various centers. Uh, there are quite a few centers that have uh, raised their hands here. So let us start with that directly. MIT University Haryana, if you have a question please go ahead. Sir, uh, sorry to ask this question but my question is on normalization sir. Hmm. Sir, uh, I want uh, to make that kind of relation so that uh, that relationship violates all the uh, normal forms. Is there is any real life example for that? an example that violates all the normal forms. Well, if it violates first normal form, it automatically violates everything else because that is a requirement for the, all the normal forms. So that is kind of trivial. But if you want to explicitly uh, show violation of uh, the other normal forms, uh, just throw in a few dependencies. You know, throw in a dependency that violates uh, BC, you know, just add a few attributes and then throw in whatever um, a couple of uh, functional dependencies and multi-value dependencies uh, as you please to show violation of the other norms, that is your goal. It is not too hard, it is a small exercise. Just take uh, five attributes and then add a few uh, functional and multi-value dependencies, uh, each tailored to uh, violate one of the normal forms and you are in business. Does that uh, make you happy? Or Sir, is there any real life example we can give? Hmm? A real life example. <laughs> Yeah, you could translate these back to real life, but um, you know, what, what is the point? If you come up with a really bad uh, design involving real life attributes, sure, uh, you know, you can violate all this. So you can uh, take uh, these attributes, do it in abstract and map it to some real life uh, meaningful attributes. It is not all that hard. It is a good exercise. It is just a fun exercise. There is no uh, real thing involved here but maybe something you can play around with and show your students. Any other question? Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. We have Maulana Azad, NIT, uh, Bhopal. If you have a question, please go ahead. Sir, what is categorical database and how can we mine the categorical database uh, as there are so many algos, but uh, not any, everybody is perfect. But a, not a single is perfect. Uh, is there any way to solve this problem? Okay, so you're leading with a data mining question. I'll invite uh, Professor Sunita Saravagi, who is here, uh, to join us and answer that question. So let me introduce uh, Professor Sunita. So uh, Professor Sunita Saravagi, as I <coughs> mentioned just a few minutes back, is one of the leading experts in the world on uh, data mining. She's worked on many sub areas, including graphical models. Uh, OLAP and data mining intersection and uh, doing data mining through SQL among many other things. Uh, and she has been the program chair for uh, the leading uh, data mining conferences in the world, which means she is recognized as one of the leading experts. So uh, let me transfer the question to her. Yeah. Uh, so actually I will ask you uh, back a question. So what do you mean by mining categorical data? What kind of mining were you trying to do? Uh, Ma'am, uh, data mining, uh, yeah. but as there are so many algos, just k means, so, uh, k mode. 
Oh, so you are trying to do clustering of categorical data. So actually for clustering categorical data, I mean clustering in general, you know, it's, it's sort of not perfect and uh, it is very much tied to the application. So uh, what is the goal of your uh, mining exercise and what are you hoping to get out, of, get out of it? What is your objective for this mining? want to mine categorical data means with data which is ordinal, nominal. Yeah, so you uh, could, uh, so there are, so for the, if the goal of mining is to discover something new and uh, serendipitous which you had not expected, then uh, you can uh, apply, you know, clustering or association rule mining. Um, and for clustering, uh, so there are many algorithms. So if you uh, look at, uh, uh, say, so there, so long time back there was a paper by Prabhakar Raghavan on clustering uh, categorical data, and then there are many forward and so you you know in general I will give give you a meta answer. So if you know of one good paper on clustering categorical data, you should uh, sort of stick in that paper's uh, title in uh, Google Scholar and look for forward citations to that paper. So look at papers which have cited this paper and then you can find about other algorithms which are possibly improvements over the algorithm which you are trying and which is perhaps not functioning for you. So I am sure there are lots of uh, such algorithms actually Professor Sudarshan will, okay maybe the network is not working. I will, you can continue, I will yeah. bring this up in the background. So you, you will uh, find other algorithms and you know if you, if you have categorical data and you are trying to look for some uh, frequency values, then sometimes uh, you are better off uh, just doing uh, explorations manually by loading the data into an OLAP tool. Uh, Professor Sudarshan must have talked about OLAP. No, I didn't. Oh, okay. So in, in his book, uh, there is mention of uh, OLAP. So in the advanced topics, you can read up about OLAP. Sometimes uh, you, are, you might be able to uh, sort of find something uh, under greater control if you uh, use uh, such OLAP tools rather than depend on some black box algorithm. Uh, hello ma'am, I am working in textual data set. Okay. And uh, I have some problem to find uh, how I, uh, I, I am convert unstructured data into structured Please. format. Okay, so, uh, so you know there are a whole range of uh, techniques available for converting unstructured data to structured data. Uh, sometimes uh, you might just be able to write some very simple rules to do the extraction. So, and uh, if your rules are slightly more complicated, you can use uh, software like gate to help you write those rules. But if your data is really, really unstructured and uh, rules will not work very well, then you can use some statistical methods and there are many software which now you can download and use for uh, training such statistical methods. Uh, so you can use, uh, so Andrew McCallum has a tool called Mallet and uh, then, okay. So uh, statistical extractors. So I am just giving some options. Uh, so one uh, option is to just use Stanford's NLP package. Write a bit slowly. Okay. Yeah. So another is to use Mallet. So a third option, if you uh, have a lot of the infrastructure and around, around extraction available to you and if you just want the core engine, then I have also developed a software for extraction, but it does not have a lot of the supporting routines, which for example, Stanford's NLP package might have. So that is uh, the CRF toolkit, which you can get from crf.sourceforge.net, okay. And uh, so for statistical extractors, uh, there must be others that I cannot quite recollect now. Um, there is also an open NLP software package, which is quite good. 
open NLP. I do not know if there are two N's or one N, N in that open NLP. So, you can just search for this term in Google and you will be able to find it. So, um, uh, for uh, the statistical extractors, I mean you should use them only if your rule based extractor is not um, able to handle the variety of data that you see in your source. But uh, unfortunately, even here, it's not like there is one golden software package that it can that you will use, and if that does not work, then nothing else will work. It's not that; it's a matter of trying out different things, and something will partly solve your problem. Uh, Ma'am, these tools are free available uh, in websites, or uh, this no, is these purchase. These are all freely available. License tools. And you before these, you can try gate. So, this is so something. Uh, so, these are the statistical extractors, but before that, if you want to just try with some start with something which is very classical, which has been around for a long time. So, this is the rule based set total environment called a gate. So, you just type gate NLP tool and you should be able to find the pointer to it from a UK university. Uh, Ma'am, uh, the capacity to convert uh, unstructured data into a structured format. So, uh, uh, how much capacity it will convert into structure, uh, structured data? So, if you consider a, a typical rule-based extractor, it will be quite fast. But the statistical extractors will be slower. And uh, you know, it depends. Uh, you know, if you are looking at like uh, numbers, what can I say? Um, I do not have exact numbers on top of my head, but they are not uh, very fast. I mean, most of them will be slow. They will be much slower than, let us say, taking an HTML page, converting it into a DOM tree, and uh, indexing that page. Suppose if that takes time x, then these will uh, take anywhere between 10 to 100 x time. Would we call it precision? So, in terms of performance, you mean accuracy? Okay, so if you are just talking about yes, accuracy of extraction, then uh, if you are uh, if you want to say think about standard uh, entities like say identifying people name and organization names from things like news articles, which are very nicely formatted English text. So from there you can get pretty decent accuracy, like uh, going to 90 percent also. But if you are talking about extracting even the same kind of entities from uh, not uh, necessarily uh, news news text, but arbitrarily uh, you know arbitrary plain text documents available on the web, the accuracy might be much lower, might be like even 70 percent. Uh, for any other kind of new entities that you uh, create, uh, you know it, it, it will of course, uh, you know it is very subjective, it depends on the type of the entity and how much training data you give for your system. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, we can show. Yeah. So actually, I was talking about using a Google Scholar for finding out uh, about more algorithms on a particular topic. So I was mentioning this one paper on clustering categorical data by Prabhakar Raghavan, and the reference was not exactly sort of uh, uh, specific in my mind. And then Professor Sudarshan did this search using Google Scholar, and he found this specific paper. And now you look. At the, for that paper, there is a link called cited by 246. So, if you click on this cited by link, you will see the papers which have cited this paper. And now, you can uh, find, uh, you know, you can find out, you know, any other article which also has high citations and which looks like an improvement over this algorithm and try them out. So, so forward citations are extremely useful in uh, helping you uh, sort of uh, figure out if there are sort of better methods than what you have been trying out. But of course, these days you might find lots of papers on a topic. So, in general a good, uh, a very rough good criteria is to look for papers which are uh, more recent because then they would have discussed all the other previous work hopefully. And also the ones which have uh, a decent number of citations themselves and appear in good venues like top tier conferences and journals.
we have Mahatma Gandhi Mission uh, Noida. Please go ahead. How we can create data cube in Oracle? Um, I have not played around with the data cube facilities in Oracle specifically. The SQL standard has a cube by uh, clause. Just as you say group by clause, you can add cube by. Uh, that will give you a relational output which has uh, all the uh, groupings. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this, let me use the whiteboard and explain it. Supposing uh, we wanted to analyze sales uh, of items by certain properties. So let's say that we have a relation which has every single sale that happened. Let's say sale ID. And then we had various uh, attributes uh, which are called dimension attributes like uh, maybe city, um, then the, uh, uh, let's say, date, time, and maybe amount. Okay. Uh, now, date and uh, time, or maybe this is time of day, but let's just uh, keep it simple. And, uh, you know, analysts may want uh, results such as uh, select uh, city, comma, date, comma, sum of amount. That is the total sa uh, sales of whatever items were sold in each city on each date from sales group by uh, city comma date. Okay, so that gives one particular aggregate. But there are many more aggregates that are possible. Maybe we want to group by city alone, maybe date alone, maybe city date and time, and maybe a number of other uh, factors as well, uh, maybe based on what was the uh, customer, uh, you know, who bought it? Was this a frequent customer, uh, occasional customer, maybe uh, some income level of customer? So there are many more things in here. And you may want to uh, group by various subsets of this. So the SQL standard has this cube by construct, city, date, time. So instead of group by, we say cube by. And essentially what it does is it creates a, a union of a large number of uh, group by queries, one for every subset of attributes here. Of course, if I uh, have a group by city and up here I have date, what is the value of date? You know, uh, there's no unique date here, so that becomes null. So that's the cube by operator in uh, SQL and uh, I'm pretty sure Oracle supports it. Beyond this, Oracle does have OLAP tools. I am not familiar with those. I have not used it. Uh, maybe Sunita has something more to say. No. no I have not used. Uh, I have also not used uh, Oracle's uh, OLAP tool. I have used uh, SQL servers long time back, like say 12 years back. And that time it was quite useful and it also had an Excel plugin. Yeah, I am sure things are much better now. Any follow up question? Here, sir, you are discussing about just aggregation, means you are work. Yes, sir. Sir, you here you are discussing about transaction level data, and over that we are using here aggregate function that is the rollup and data cube. But yeah. I, my question is what how we can implement data cube by using Oracle, like a star schema, snowflake like schema, and fact constellation. We can implement it in Oracle by using this uh, primary key and foreign key constraint over the fact table and dimension table. So that actual implementation, how we can implement? Okay. I think your question is, how do you do schema design uh, for a, a warehouse on top of which you can do this cube? Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have been looking at uh, various uh, methods for doing schema design, ER modeling, normalization, and so on. Now, for uh, data cubes, uh, the way you design the schema is uh, quite different. Um, I don't have a whole lot of practical experience in this, uh, but the general idea is that uh, most of the applications where you need uh, these kinds of things, the schema kind of presents itself in the sense of having uh, some sales relation or some other such thing, one or a few fact tables, which are, uh, you know, there, there are a large number of records here. This is the core around which everything revolves in this, uh, in the case of OLAP. 
and around this core uh, you need to build various dimension tables. So in my quick and dirty example I had date and time, uh, but it is not just by date that you want to do grouping, uh, you might want to uh, worry about quarters, you might want to worry about financial years, you may want to dig deeper and have a monthly analysis. So you can uh, build hierarchies on this. <coughs> so uh, those uh, dimension tables and their attributes are driven by the business needs. Now there are some things which are obvious, uh, once you have date, most, uh, most of the OLAP is for business analysis. So the uh, month, uh, quarter, uh, you know, financial year, all those things are very obvious candidates. Um, similarly on uh, day of the week is another obvious thing if you want to worry about uh, weekend uh, demand versus weekday demand, obviously for a business uh, that is actually selling products, the demand varies widely between uh, these categories. So there are various hierarchies you can uh, build on this and then, uh, so those are all part of the dimension tables and then you can uh, define uh, cubes not only on the, uh, you know, the underlying uh, uh, date for example, but also on uh, the hierarchy in there, date, week and so forth. Uh, so you, so, uh, so you come up with a schema based on your uh, data which you have collected. Typically, it's fairly simple uh, OLTP data in large volume, and then a whole bunch of other dimension tables uh, which uh, work around it. Um, and the dimension tables themselves, you should not usually apply normalization. So, for example, if I have a dimension table date that is, has one entry per every date, now. Given the date based on the month and uh, you know the day of the month and or other such things, I could always use a lookup table to find out the day of the week, uh, the quarter, the financial year and so forth. Um, but uh, and also given uh, uh, let us say a uh, quarter, uh, maybe I can, uh, well no, this is not a good example. But in general, uh, if you have a city ID for example. Uh, from that, uh, the city ID would uh, automatically determine the state. There is a functional dependency from city to state and from state to country maybe if states have unique names across countries. So if you did a normalization of the dimension tables, you would split it up. But in the OLAP context, uh, people specifically avoid normalization for efficiency because the goal here is not to, you know, you are not updating OLAP data directly. The updates are happening somewhere else and you are just copying it into this. Uh, and redundancy is a good thing here in the sense of if it can speed up your uh, query processing, redundancy is perfectly fine. There is nothing wrong with redundancy. So for the dimension tables, uh, there is no attempt at all made to avoid uh, such redundancy and the focus is on efficiency. So uh, the design of a OLAP schema is quite different from the design of a traditional uh, relational schema. Okay, I hope that has partly answered your question. If you have a follow up, please go ahead. Yes. Yes, sir. sir, one more question I want to ask. Can I ask? Yeah, My next question related with the graph mining. When we are using graph mining, then so how we will store graph in database by using Oracle? Uh, so there are a lot of tools for uh, storing very large graphs uh, which have come about in recent years. Uh, which uh, fall in the big data realm even. Uh, and the goal is uh, to partition the graphs across machines. So this is a uh, research work which I am familiar with. Now just storing a graph in a database uh, at the core is very simple. The schema for it is straightforward. The issue is how does this gel with data mining? Um, so uh, my experience is if you store uh, you know, a graph in the database uh, and then you want to do querying on it, Yes, you can issue SQL queries to go and fetch data, but it's not necessarily efficient. So uh, for other graph related stuff, for example, in the work on keyword search on graphs which we have done, if we had to go do SQL queries each time to access, uh, you know, node and the edges out of the node, you're dead. It's too slow. So the only realistic thing was to extract the, so you store the graph in the database for persistence, but when your uh, service starts up, it loads the uh, graph from the database into memory and has an in-memory graph representation and then works off it for keyword query. I'm pretty sure the same thing would hold for any graph mining algorithm where the graph is small enough to fit in one machine's memory. 
um, and also to be analyzed efficiently uh, using a few CPUs which are connected to that memory. Uh, but today, graphs, uh, social network graphs and so forth have gone way beyond this. So you have to partition the graph somehow. So there's been some work on it, uh, including some work uh, we, which we did a while ago in a slightly different context, which was uh, keyword search on graphs which are larger than memory. Our goal was not to partition it across machines, although that was a side effect, uh, but how to uh, you know, keep the thing in the database in some special form and then load parts of it on demand, uh, min loading just the minimal parts needed to answer keyword queries again. Uh, so uh, we, we worked on that. Uh, that's where I have some familiarity with this area. Uh, but there's been a lot of work uh, subsequently on graph clustering and uh, search algorithms on graphs. Um, so uh, one of the relevant things here, uh, let me write this down. So uh, there is a system called Pregel from Google, okay, uh, which uh, is based on a very old paradigm called uh, bulk synchronous processing or BSP. Uh, so the basic idea is very old. But Pregel is a recent implementation of this paradigm, uh, which lets you do a number of queries on graphs, and where the graph is uh, split across many machines. So if you look up the Pregel paper, uh, you can find more information on that. Uh, just search for Pregel and uh, Google, perhaps. That should get you to that paper. Again, uh, as before, scholar dot google.com is your friend. Uh, gives you a lot of uh, uh, information about papers. So, so actually, uh, there is uh, for graph uh, mining specifically, uh, Graph Lab is another uh, sort of software, sort of a platform, which is supposed to uh, do a better job with irregular graphs. So, Graph Lab, it is a uh, software develop in a university, so I do not know whether it is um, as good as the platform that you will get with Triggle, but it is definitely worth exploring. Yeah. Graph Lab, it is from CMU. Anyway, you cannot get Priggle. <laughs> Priggle is not open source, Okay. Uh, but there are some clones of Priggle which people are working on. Uh, so I think uh, there is some Apache project which is cloning Priggle. I do not remember the name, but it should be out soon, if not already. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, uh, that, that provides a platform. It does not implement any graph mining algorithm on its own. So all that has to be done on top of this platform. Um, I don't know if Mahout uh, provides any support also for Should graph mining, do you know? No, I don't know about Mahout. But Graph Lab, uh, my student has uh, been experimenting and uh, it's sort of he's uh, found it better than, uh, I don't know with Pregel what software whether he tried and he uh, just did a theoretical comparison. Sure. And um, so, yeah. Graph Lab is also worthwhile trying. They definitely implement uh, belief propagation, which is basically an inference algorithm on a graphical model built on top of a large graph. Okay. So, uh, I have not used Mahout uh, specifically, but there is this Apache Mahout project. So Apache Mahout is a, a set of uh, programs, if you will, which are targeted at mining of big data. So this sits on top of Hadoop. Uh, we'll be covering Hadoop tomorrow for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, Hadoop is not designed specifically for graph mining. It's a, a parallel processing paradigm uh, based on this thing called MapReduce. It's, it's a parallel process. It's a the paradigm is MapReduce. Um, Hadoop is an implementation of that paradigm. Uh, and Apache Mahout is a set of uh, tools for data mining in general, which sit on top of this. So they can work on very large data. Uh, I suspect there would be uh, some parts of uh, Mahout which target uh, some kinds of graph mining. I'm not familiar enough with it to say that for sure, but I suspect it would be there. Uh, my question is uh, related to data mining, especially like uh, association rule mining. Like as we know, when we uh, apply association rule mining, we do get a uh, lot of redundant fields. So, can you give an idea like uh, how can we apply genetic algorithm for removing this redundancy, especially the fitness function, which will be the better fitness function 
to remove the association uh, redundant rules in the association rule mining that is being generated by any uh, any algorithm for association rule mining Correct. okay so um, so the answer i don't know much about genetic algorithms but there are uh, many ideas which have been proposed since the original association rule mining paper on removing redundant rules so one set of papers again you will have to use the same trick uh, as uh, i was telling about this categorical clustering on uh, searching through google scholar but there is uh, one set of techniques which have been developed by um, haiki manila and uh, i don't remember the other author so which talks about how to use uh, essentially the a very well defined statistical notion of the measure of surprise of a particular item set given the observed frequencies of subsets of the item set to filter out uh, high dimensional patterns which are not surprising given the lower dimensional patterns so that is one set of techniques uh, so in 1998 uh, i and uh, with another colleague we did we also did another sort of dimension of work at, on a, along a different dimension on getting rid of redundant rules and that is by exploiting uh, time so any rule which holds steady for a long time is assumed to be known by the analyst is therefore and is therefore not interesting so you want to modify association rule mining algorithms assuming that with each transaction you also have a time stamp available to output those rules which have interesting but steady variation along time so that is uh, another uh, piece of uh, work so in general though if you start from that uh, haike manila paper and then there is another paper by um, by rajiv motwani and um, and uh, jeffrey alman which is sort of which started this uh, line of work on uh, finding interesting rules uh, and uh, if you look at forward pointers to that paper you will find lots of other work on uh, filtering away the many redundant but not so interesting rules that association rule mining produces so there is actually a very huge literature on the topic that you have asked so you will have to do quite some reading but i cannot comment about uh, the use of genetic algorithms i am not familiar with genetic algorithms and i am not also a big fan of genetic algorithms okay we can take uh, questions from some other center mps tme shirpur within the same application can i use a special query as well as a normal relational query how can i use it okay yeah in fact uh, that is not at all uncommon uh, so uh, for example i may have uh, shops which sell certain things and uh, so i have relational data about what uh, shop sells what things so i might uh, filter out shops based on some relational predicates and at the same time i want uh, spatial information also i want things which are close by so as long as your uh, spatial data is in the relational database uh, and the database supports uh, these queries uh, yes you can certainly ask queries which have both uh, regular relational predicates and spatial predicates uh, so the uh, oracle uh, spatial uh, extensions uh, uh, certainly support uh, these combinations as far as i know Uh, i think uh, postgres also has this post gis I, as far as i know it's not very efficient but if you just want to uh, try out these queries uh, it's a perfectly good platform uh, so i i think that also supports uh, spatial predicates integrated with sql so it's pretty straightforward to ask these questions which combine spatial and uh, regular relational predicates uh, so the next question is um, can i use in the same application more type of databases uh, for an example i am using oracle db2 and postgres in same application is it uh, applicable or not is it possible or not okay it is possible but uh, not highly recommended there may be some historical reasons for it for example in iit bombay we have uh, our financial records on an oracle database because that's what the uh, tcs uh, built and our own uh, academic records which we built the system for are in postgres so the moment you do this there is always an issue of keeping the two in sync if you add a student you better add it in both databases if you add a faculty member you better add it in both databases if you give a scholarship uh, which is recorded in the 
for, uh, student in the academic database, it had also better be recorded in the Oracle database. So all of these have to be kept in sync, so there is more work. Um, but if it is needed for other reasons, it is perfectly feasible. You just have to decide what all data is going to reside in both and uh, set up mechanisms to ensure that the two keep, are kept in sync. Uh, sir, one last question is there. Uh, suppose I have already created database uh, in SQL which is of uh, extension .bc, uh, .bck and now I want to use that database in Postgres where the extension is .backup. So how to do that? Uh, you want a backup created on one database to be restored on another database? Um, I don't think that will work. Uh, you can uh, do an SQL dump, that is uh, uh, where the system outputs a bunch of SQL, uh, you know, create table, insert table commands and so forth. Uh, those are a little more portable. Uh, but otherwise, I think there are uh, commercial or what, maybe an open source, I have not used them, but there are tools to uh, export data from one database, convert the format and then load it into another. Uh, but I'm not familiar enough. If you do a Google search, you will find these tools. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, we have Sri Jaya Chamarajendra College, Mysore. Please go ahead. Who uses Hadoop and MapReduce? Can we use it for uh, Aadhaar, sir? Your comments? Can you use uh, Hadoop and MapReduce for Aadhaar? Uh, mean, Hadoop uh, for Aadhaar, sir. So it depends on what kinds of things you want to do. So if your uh, goal is uh, to use Aadhaar to validate a person who has come to a ration shop, then Hadoop and MapReduce play absolutely no role. Uh, but if your goal is to do some analysis on the Aadhaar data, maybe to even check for uh, duplicate, somebody who has registered twice and so forth, uh, then uh, maybe uh, these tools would be useful. Uh, so it depends on what you want to do with it. These tools are good for uh, decision support and certain other kinds of uh, bulk querying, um, but not for uh, you know small transactions which do just a little bit of work. The, those are not the right tools. There are other tools for that if you want to uh, have a massively parallel database. So Aadhaar is large, um, and I'm sure it has to be split amongst multiple databases. Uh, does it qualify as uh, really big data from the viewpoint of Validation, maybe not. It's fairly easy to break it up into multiple data, you know, to uh, partition it horizontally. Um, the hard part of other is uh, to see if people are applying twice. That, that's easily the hardest part. Maybe Sunita has something to say about this. Yeah, I mean, that is actually really a hard problem. And uh, even in general, given a database of size n, and if you want to look in that database, all possible duplicates that might exist. Uh, you know, the theoretically you will have to do a quadratic time computation, but of course you cannot afford that. So, you know, but it's a, a very expensive computation. You might have to take maybe, uh, at least you might have to compare a record with uh, 10,000 other records. Actually, well, maybe in the case of the whole Aadhaar database, it might be more like 1 million. Yeah, so it, it's a very expensive operation. So you might have to, uh, you know, there are many algorithms which uh, are available for uh, doing duplicate detection in large databases, some which involve, uh, which in assume a pre-existing index, others which sort of create multiple signatures and they only will uh, sort of compare record groups within a, uh, records within a group which have the same signature. And then there are other sort of, you know, blocking techniques where you create signatures where the order makes sense and you sort your data based on that uh, sort of, you know, order sensitive signature and you do a sliding window kind of search. So there are many algorithms which are uh, sort of like a fuzzy join kind of algorithms which you will have to implement. Yeah, and in such cases, MapReduce, uh, yeah, you know, if you use the signature based methods, you could use MapReduce. Uh, we have eBet group in uh, Tamil Nadu. Is there exist any widely accepted algorithmic approach for performing outlier analysis on large data sets? Uh, I'll defer that to Professor Sunita. Okay. So actually outlier uh, analysis is like clustering. It's basically the complement of clustering. So there is no one single algorithm which will work for all kinds of data. 
there are many algorithms uh, around. I mean, there are. I mean, for example, if you have, uh, if you are looking for outliers in uh, OLAP kind of data, you would use a very different algorithm than if you are looking for outliers in, say, uh, you know, just uh, categorical transactional data, like say the ones which are kind of analyzed by association rule mining. So, uh, yeah, I would not say there is one widely accepted algorithms. In fact, uh, you know, it is maybe even less so than for the case of clustering, where maybe k-means is that one widely accepted algorithm. Now, in general for outlier detection, the, the, the meta rule which is followed is that you create a model. That model can be a clustering model. And then an outlier is anything which does not fit very well in that model. Uh, so, with that rule, you know, with different instantiations of models and the models will be chosen based on the kind of data that you have, you will have different algorithms for outlier analysis. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I have myself not done too much work on outlier analysis for general data, but I did work on outlier analysis for multidimensional OLAP kind of data and there we actually built a a, a sort of a multidimensional model like a, a you know ANOVA kind of model with with time series modeling and we looked for outlier in that OLAP data and there that model was a, a very nice fit and we found interesting outliers. Uh, but I would not use that model for some other kind of data. It was specifically chosen for OLAP data assuming that the number of dimensions is not very very large. So, you know, if you have some specific kind of data in mind, maybe I can elaborate more. But in general, no, I don't know of any one well accepted algorithm. One more question pertaining to uh, queries, SQL queries. It is assumed that uh, queries, SQL queries involving uh, uh, Cartesian products uh, is always uh, imposing a lot of overhead on the optimization side. Uh, it is better to, it is suggested that better to uh, write queries or replace queries uh, which usually does not involve uh, Cartesian products of tables. Uh, this statement is, uh, how far this is true sir, let me, let us want to know this. I mean, uh, is it recommended to uh, perform uh, or write queries which involves Cartesian products or there should be queries which are free from uh, Cartesian products of tables. So, I can't think of any, um, uh, pretty much any meaningful domain where you actually want a full Cartesian. There are a few rare cases where you, for example, if your goal was to do a for loop over several things and you want to code that in SQL, uh, then there are some cases where there can be Cartesian products. So we cannot rule out queries with Cartesian products saying that they are totally useless. Okay, so for example, if I have a year a table with, uh, you know, with years, uh, each row is one year, uh, 2000, 2001 and so on. And another table with months, with the things being January, February, March and so forth. Then a Cartesian product of this would give me a month year combination, uh, which I might use to uh, do something else later in the query. So occasionally a Cartesian product like this could be useful, but uh, it's rare. Most of the time, uh, you, uh, you know, a Cartesian product, unless you intentionally did it is probably an error. You forgot to put a join condition. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, GRIT Kukatpalli, Andhra, please go ahead. Uh, what, what exactly the difference between uh, federated databases and data warehousing? Okay, so federated databases is a term which has generally been used to uh, mean that let's say you had a number of databases within your organization and sometimes this happens because uh, two organizations merge Air India and Indian Airlines merged which was a big mess uh, of course uh, but uh, the fact is that they would each have had their own computer systems and if you want to merge the computer systems then one of them has to dump its system and move all the data to the other uh, and that might cause some problems operationally. So maybe they continue operating their own computer systems, just like they continue operating Airbus planes and Boeing planes and uh, so forth. But now the issue is that uh, you do need uh, data from bo both of these databases. They need to see each other's data. 
So federated database is where uh, each of them continues to operate as a separate database, but you, are, uh, you provide some support such that uh, you can have uh, queries uh, run from one of them. It's allowed to access data from the other, maybe even do joins with data from the other, and so forth. So that's a federated database. And then you might even allow transactions uh, on uh, which span these things. So uh, the databases are still separate, but you provide some kind of view on top which lets you do queries and updates across the two databases. Does the functionality same in both? The two continue to run exactly as they did for their own functionality. <laughs> what you do is you add some more stuff on top which lets them interoperate with each other. So if you have a query, new query on one which needs to access data on the other, it can do that. If you want a update transaction uh, which uh, runs on one but also needs to update some data on the other, then you can do that. So that's what a federated database is. They still have their independence, but you allow certain operations to span uh, two or more databases. Last question, sir. Uh, can you suggest any sites for, I mean, uh, same question just I asked in the previous also regarding uh, spatial data mining. Uh, can you suggest any sites for uh, getting the data sets on spatial data mining? Um, yeah, so I think I said I will uh, provide a link to sites. I have not had time to do that. Um, let me just put this down so you can uh, search yourself. Uh, so there is, uh, I mentioned a few things. There is uh, US census data. These are things I'm aware, you can find this easily. There's a tiger data set which many people have used. Uh, for, I'm, this is for spatial query processing, but I'm sure there's some mining aspect. Uh, but the other thing is uh, you can uh, get in touch with uh, Professor NL Sarda, who uh, heads the GISC, uh, I think that is uh, Geographical Information Systems Engineering or something lab here, he's um, a senior colleague here uh, at IIT Bombay. So if you uh, search for him, uh, you'll be able to, find, you can also, I think they also have a web page for this lab. Uh, so they have been collecting data sets from various places. I don't know if they can share those things, but you can certainly uh, contact uh, him and uh, get more information about availability of data sets from Indian sources because he's been working on that. Uh, other than that, I know that there are many, many more uh, data sets of uh, road networks and other such stuff which are publicly available. Um, so you can search for them. I think European road networks, there are some data sets. There are many others. I, I can't name specific ones, but it's not too hard to find some kinds of data sets, whether that matches what you want to do, if you want to look at a particular data mining problem, you know, does a road network data set help you at all? Maybe not. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I have not worked in this area, so I cannot directly point you to things. But I can help you search for these later. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. We have uh, Rajalakshmi Engineering College, Chennai. Please go ahead. Hello. Good evening, sir. Like this question regarding association rule mining. So while uh, applying association rule mining, uh, we have been ready getting a lot of overlapping rules and redundant rules. Is there is any specific tool or algorithm to reduce that? Uh, Professor Sunita will answer that question. Okay. Maybe, so this question was asked just a while back and I gave an uh, answer to that question. So let me write down this time. So maybe it will... Uh, Sort of, you can then search on Google Scholar. So there is uh, basically the first paper on this topic was um, written by, you know, there were other author, authors, but I remember two of the authors. So Rajiv Motwani and uh, Jeff Alman. So there was a paper which, uh, don't remember the title, but definitely there was association rule mining in it. So this was... Uh, may be written say roughly in 1997 I think okay and uh, uh, write a little better it's not very clear oh okay yeah okay so this was one pointer and then there is another sort of uh, paper by Eki Manila so which also talks about interesting 
I am not giving the exact titles, but just some keywords with which you can search. Creation rules, some search. Tools in addition to people. Yeah, but tools, uh, okay. I, uh, so, if you search in, I will uh, come to that later. So, this was uh, I think 1999, okay. And uh, then uh, I have done some work on this with uh, some colleagues when we were in IBM. So, this was uh, the paper with Chakrabarti and Dom. So, this was a paper on temporal association rule mining. So, which talks about etcetera. And now, now you talk about tools. So, uh, you know this is there was a question I saw which was uh, sort of put uh, in that uh, which was just asked on the online. So, in general, if you just go to www.kdnuggets.com, you can find pointers to uh, many data mining software tools. And uh, I think most of them which do association rule mining would also now have some support for uh, managing the very, very large number of rules that a typical association rule mining algorithm would produce. And uh, since these are now sort of, uh, you know, many years have passed since some of these papers were written, I expect that these will also appear in the tools which you can sort of search on this website. Um, I mean, can we apply association rules for this XML mining XML documents? For what documents? Like XML documents, like you. So far, we have XML documents. So, uh, association rule mining has, you know, the input to association rule mining uh, is a set of sets. So, it does not matter whether your document is in XML format or in uh, any text format. You have to convert your data into this set of discrete sets format. And then you also have to think whether it makes sense to run association rule mining on the set of sets that you have created. So, you know it does not matter, you know what in what format, you know in what format the data is stored really. It is basically, uh, you know you think about the abstract input that is required by association rule mining operation and see whether you can, you know, whether your XML data actually contains sets of records where each set in turn can be thought of or it can be converted through some simple transformation into a set. Uh, Narayana Engineering College, Nellur, please go ahead. Sir, I am having one doubt in related to the human behavior analysis, sir. So, can you suggest me best algorithm which is suitable to analyze a human specific behavior. Mm. Sorry, I do not know anything about that area. Sunita, would you know? Actually, human specific behavior, you know, I, if you look at the WWW conference, WWW conference, they have, uh, you know, if you are talking about human you know, modeling user behavior for browsing, you know, it depends on what kind of user modeling that you are trying to do. But if you want to consider user modeling for, uh, say, for uh, on web browsing, so that you can, uh, you know, find out, uh, you know, what a user is trying to do within a session, you know, there are lots of, uh, you know, over the years you will find, uh, you know, there is some or the other uh, track will be talking about human modeling. Uh, I mean, but I am not familiar with this area. I just remember seeing such uh, track titles in the. Dub 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 conference. You know this conference. Uh, I just. So if you uh, sort of look for, you know, you know every year you will find uh, you can just look at the set of papers which have been published in that year and essentially search for human 
and then look at the papers which talk about some of the other aspect of human modeling. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Bansal Institute, Lucknow. Please go ahead, Bansal. Good evening, sir. My question is, what verification methods of research findings in technical research except mathematical proof are acceptable as research efforts? So, this is a deep question. What is uh, research effort? What is not? Uh, so, that, that's a very hard question to answer in general. Uh, to me, research would be anything where you have some novel finding. Uh, depending on the venue where you submit your research, the expectations of uh, what is novel vary. Uh, so, I don't know if you can have a generic definition across uh, all areas and so forth. Uh, but in computer science, uh, you know, the, in, in the olden days, the research was primarily about uh, coming up with new algorithms for doing stuff. Um, but I think uh, now there are also other uh, kinds of things which may be acceptable. Uh, for example, if you, there are a lot of algorithms, but for a particular domain, maybe finding out which algorithm makes, is the best fit for a domain might be considered acceptable research in many venues. Um, as an example, uh, you know, there are a lot of tools for teaching. Now, if you are doing a study of uh, which tools work uh, well for uh, teaching students, uh, you know, that m may or may not count as research in a computer science conference. But in an education conference, that would probably count as research. So what is research partly depends on where you are targeting it. So there are certainly conferences which look at these things, and it is important. I mean, if when you decide to use a particular tool, you might do it by gut feeling. Um, on the other hand, your gut feeling may be wrong. You know, we put in all these fancy tools into place, and in the end, the student's learning may not be helped at all. Uh, so was it worth it? This is the kind of things which people do study, and it is a valid topic for research. I don't know if that answered your question. You feel free to ask follow-up questions. Sir, I have um, a few more uh, things to ask, in fact. Um, uh, uh, my prime concern was that you see, I am talking about the technical research. Uh, 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 so in, in that area, suppose uh, we, we can take an example, if uh, we are talking about some database design or some database design, so if we propose some model or design, so what evidential proof uh, we have to put forward to get it acceptable in the uh, research community? Uh, we can take an example of data warehousing. Suppose we say that the involvement of user is very important uh, for the successful data warehousing uh, development. So, uh, what background work we have to show means it is not always the mathematical proof of anything. Because you see, when we talk of the industry environment, where they are working on the practical things, and in the academics we are doing the things theoretically. So, how to bridge that gap? That is uh, my prime concern. I would be grateful if you can uh, give some idea on that, sir. So, uh, in uh, some of these domains, so you say, what is the importance of getting user input on data warehousing? Right? So, if you are just doing a study with one particular implementation, it's very difficult to say anything much. You know, you can't, it's hard to draw conclusions. Uh, but in the software engineering domain, uh, these kinds of things are common. You know, people propose a particular methodology. And uh, you, know, you can propose many different methodologies for doing things, uh, but how do you compare them? So one way would be to study projects which use these things and see uh, how successful they were and try to uh, get uh, feedback from the people involved in the project to see what, were the, what they felt were contributing factors. And uh, so this kind of human feedback uh, might uh, help in establishing that, uh, you know, Doing, taking user input in a particular way is very important for the success of that project. Uh, so in software engineering, I have seen uh, papers like, it's not an area I'm very closely familiar with, but I know that there is work which looks at such issues. And that is considered valid research in that area. It's not mathematical modeling. It's uh, taking uh, certain ways of doing things and studying how successful they were when used in a variety of projects. In general, anything like this, uh, you want to establish that it has value beyond one project. So uh, it's kind of required to do the study across many things, so that you're talking of stuff which has 
general applicability in a wide variety of scenarios. And that would be considered publication worthy. If you did something which is very specific to one project and it is not clear how to use it in any other project, uh, that may not necessarily count as research. I do not know if that answers your question better. Sir, uh, one last question uh, regarding the uh, significance of white papers which are available on the net. So how uh, authentic they should be considered? Because I have seen uh, these kind of uh, stuff having uh, lots of uh, important things, means like lots of technical coverage and that. So are, are they uh, considered as an authentic reference in case of research? Okay, that's a good question. So white papers are typically put up by companies uh, when they have a product and uh, they want to help you understand what the product is about. And sometimes they also do a comparison with uh, other alternatives. Uh, so these are papers written by companies. They can help you understand what is going on. But if company X claims that um, you know, their methodology is uh, or their tool is uh, better than a uh, you know, tool of somebody else in their white paper, uh, you of course have to question who wrote it. This is unlikely. You know, I have not seen too many white papers which do these kinds of things. But supposing you want to cite a white paper to show that product X is better than product Y, uh, that may be questionable. But if you are referring to the white paper to say that this is how uh, you know, this particular tool does something, then uh, yeah, you know, that is perfectly fine. So they are useful sources of information. They can be cited. That is not a problem at all. Um, but they are not the same as a research paper which is written by an independent party which maybe compares two things. But of course, uh, you know, most research papers are not written by independent parties. Most research papers propose some technique and then they proceed to compare their own technique with others. So uh, every one of these has to be taken with a certain pinch of salt. Obviously, their goal is to show what they are doing is better. Obviously, they will look at scenarios where what they have done is uh, where their technique beats the others. Does it mean that technique will beat the others in all scenarios? Uh, may not be. So any paper at all has to be looked at with a certain pinch of salt and that is an important part of research actually. If you just accept everything at face value, uh, you know, uh, then uh, you are not questioning things enough. Uh, but of course your questioning should be in a way that leads to something new and interesting which you can uh, publish perhaps. That, that would be your goal as a researcher. I don't know if that helps again. Thank you very much, sir. Shanmuga College, Tamil Nadu. What are the database administration tools are available in the research site and which is most used in the research site? Database administration tools. So, uh, by this, I the uh, from the research context, the tools which are which have been developed by researchers are things which automate the administration. The goal is to uh, not have uh, humans who are doing the administration, let the system configure itself to the largest extent possible. Uh, so many of the tools which you see uh, today, which we talked about, you know, the tools for index tuning, materialized view tuning and other related things, uh, they all came out of research. Researchers said like, uh, you know, we, we don't want uh, to have highly paid administrators doing this. We want the system to do all this more or less by itself with minimal human intervention. So how do you do this? Then there was a lot of interesting research which was required to make those tools work uh, properly and efficiently. Um, now, are there tools which researchers use in order to do their research? I'm not sure that uh, you know there's anything which researchers use in that sense. The, Tools which come packaged with the databases were developed by researchers initially and maybe by other developers later. Uh, does that answer your question or is there some other aspect to what you asked about? Yes, yes, you got it, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, Sarvajani College Surat. Please go ahead. Sir, is there any research effort made in the direction of uh, in-memory indexing or hashing uh, in context of uh, uh, intermediate results generated during uh, joint quer uh, queries on joint tables in context of uh, query optimization? In the 
in the context of what is the last thing you said query optimization query optimization okay uh, i don't know if there is a research angle to this the it's just the in memory indices used for intermediate results have primarily been uh, you know hash indices as far as long as you are saying that the joins are simple equi joins however if you look at more complex join conditions uh, then it's different in fact uh, it's interesting you ask this question because right now i have an mtech student and a phd student looking at exactly this kind of problem how do you build indices uh, where the join predicate is of a particular form uh, it, the, the tuples have patterns that is they could have an exact value or they could have a, a value which says all possible values are acceptable star now when you how do you do join processing when uh, you have a number of join attributes and number of relations and uh, then these uh, tuples in individual relations can have a mixture one tuple may uh, say a b another may say a star another may say star c so how do you do joins in this context so that's something which we are currently working on uh, we are not you know there may be other work in this area we have not looked at it in depth yet but yes uh, if you are looking at more than simple equi joins uh, there are surely interesting issues here uh, the other aspect is uh, just uh, in memory indexing uh, not during join processing but in the context of in memory databases uh, what indexing technique would work best for data which is already in memory you don't have to load it from disk b trees were designed for disk data uh, there's been a lot of work on this for many many years and uh, there is still some ongoing work uh, some of these have been varying because the uh, properties of memory has changed the uh, way memory uh, lines are loaded caching there have been a lot of uh, hardware changes along the way um, and also main memory databases uh, now become not only feasible but they are becoming uh, common in in the real world sap has released a database called hana uh, microsoft uh, i believe is also releasing a version of sql server which is tailored for main memory many others there are like uh, i believe some 20 or 40 different main memory database tools uh, implementations whatever available Uh, there's an interesting talk which one of my friends, uh, Rajesh Manchramani, uh, has uh, he, he showed me a copy of his talk which he gave somewhere. So there's a lot of work on indexing uh, main uh, in main memory. Uh, so it's an active area. Uh, still, it's a little hard to do brand new stuff because there's been so much stuff. Thank you, sir. Okay, okay the last two uh, hand. Ah, okay. Finally, we have the very last question from uh, what is this? Alluri Institute, Warangal. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Which one is the most suitable data set in stream mining, sir? That's a hard question. I don't know what data sets are available in uh, in the context of streaming. I mean, there are a lot of applications of streaming data. Uh, you know, the sensor data which are available. I I know that. Um, you know this uh, in berkeley you know mike franklin and all uh, you know if you just uh, look in their group they have been working on sensor data and also i mean i don't know now whether they are like at least 5 years back there used to be all these sensor data which were available which you could use for streaming applications uh, but uh, again i think the google scholar trick works so i know that mike franklin so if i have to look for streaming data what i would do is uh, the m got garbled oh, my m got garbled yeah sometimes it doesn't work yeah okay. so if you just search uh, for his name and go to uh, look at his research papers many of them are on stream various kinds of uh, query processing models and others uh, having to do with stream data so now you look for forward pointers to those papers look at uh, some of the recent papers on stream data mining and see what paper what data sets they have used in their papers uh, uh, very often researchers use data sets which are publicly available and uh, those might be also then you know very useful for you 
is is stock market is it suitable for stream mining madam stock market data yeah it's a particular kind of data i think it's a, it, yeah. it's a very you know it has uh, some specific properties may, which may not hold for other stream mining applications but yeah you can certainly use stock marketing data but it is it will be interesting to also explore some non stock marketing data because uh, you know stock marketing is a very very stylized kind of application so one more question sir is there any other open source tool in data mining apart from veka that question will go to madam not to sir yeah apart from uh, veka so uh, there is a, a statistical tool which is very popular in universities called uh, system r you know system r uh, system r is a database tool this is also r so this is actually a command line tool so this is uh, r and it is a uh, i mean i have not used it myself so it's not totally on the top of my head but it's a r statistical analysis package and now what professor sudarshan was mentioning earlier there is mahut which is available which is uh, an apache data mining tool it is also supposed to be scalable and uh, freely available so these are the options but you know in general you know this kdnuggets.com it's a very useful website website to visit and if you click on their software tab you will find pointers to uh, to lots of other freely available software uh, like any research issues in object oriented uh, databases no? object relational databases okay research issues in object oriented or object relational databases object relational databases were also hot a long time ago again i'm not sure if there are any brand new research angles which have come up recently like any area which has been examined in great detail a while ago uh, you need some new angle to it to uh, come up with new research in that area uh, the object relational mapping systems on the other hand uh, have uh, taken off a lot recently uh, and uh, they did not receive all that much attention in the research community object relational mapping systems so there might be some uh, research angles in this uh, and in fact uh, one of the things we are doing is a project which uh, attempts to optimize uh, database access from applications so the idea is uh, traditional database optimization would optimize sql queries uh, but if applications do bad things and issue millions of queries there's nothing the database can do it can run each query fast but if there are millions of queries things are going to be slow on the other hand you can rewrite applications to change those million queries into a far fewer number of queries which will then run much much faster so how do you automate the rewriting of applications is an area that we have been looking at in the uh, so we took any java program and so we can rewrite it uh, to optimize uh, so we change the jdbc calls we and we recognize jdbc calls then rewrite it to optimize database access uh, so there's a very interesting project my last phd student uh, who graduated some years ago did a fantastic phd on that and i have another student working on it and several master students that area has worked out very well um, one of the related things is that uh, people are also using uh, object relational mapping tools like hibernate so we also did some work on how to or take a hibernate program and optimize its access to databases uh, so that work is uh, you know we did a little bit of work there's probably more to be done uh, so there are certainly uh, issues in uh, when when these have become real systems people are more worried about uh, issues in here uh, how to ensure that uh, hibernate's concurrency control mechanism doesn't cause a mess somewhere you know there are a lot of practical problems which people have with these systems so efficiency is Uh, one of the major factors um so uh, this could lead in turn to research problems in this sub area does that answer your question thank you sir thank you very much okay thank you very much i think we will uh, call it a day thank you for staying back uh, so long beyond the official uh, end which was 6 o'clock um so we'll see you tomorrow then